would you find Genesis chapter 6, and would you stand with me out of respect of God's Word as we read verse 5 down to verse 10. Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. The Bible says this, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now let that verse sink in. <laughs> not one thought. Nothing was pleasing to the Lord. Not one action. Everything. Just continual evil. Verse 6 it says, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Now the word repent that we used last night from the Greek word that means to change your mind would be different than this. God doesn't have to change his mind because God does not make any mistakes at all. He gave man a free will, but that still was not a mistake on God's part. What it really has to do with is God is sorrowful and he's grieving of their wickedness and that he even made man who then became so wicked. In verse 7, it says this, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations or descendants of Noah, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God, and Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The title of the message tonight is, What Did Noah Build? What Did Noah Build? Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts, help us to follow you, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. In college, one of the most unique classes I took was a sailing class, not selling class, but sailing as in getting in a boat and putting up the sail, and it was a catamaran sailboat. And before we could get on the boat, we had to learn all the parts. Here's the main sail, and here's the, um, uh, here's the boom. I remember what that was. That was the, the cylinder at the bottom part of the sail. And when it would swing over, you had to duck when it would change sides. If you didn't, it would hit your head and it would go boom. And uh, so I remember that one. And then it had these metal frames and this canvas that would be on it. And it had two white holes that it would be on. And uh, I don't remember any other parts. <laughs> uh, but we had to learn all that before we could ever get onto the sailboat. And certain times we'd go out and it was okay. It wasn't great because the wind wasn't great or the direction of the wind wasn't great. But one particular time, we were getting ready, and my partner was my future brother-in-law. <laughs> How neat was that? And uh, so we were um, getting ready, and, uh, and we looked at each other and said, this is going to be a good day. It's a strong wind coming from the shore, pushing out into the bay, and we knew this was going to be pretty strong. And so pretty good. <clears throat> so there's, it's a two-man catamaran, so I was going to do like all the assistant type stuff on that particular day. He was going to do the main sail and then also some of the main things. Uh, and so uh, we we're ready. We get up, you know, out to the water and about our shin, shins or whatever, and then we jump onto the sailboat. And as soon as he lets out the sail just a little bit, boom, it just takes off. It's kind of like getting in gear with a sports car. You can tell this is going to be a good day. He then asks me, do you want me to let out the sail a little bit more? To which I say, yes. And it's like changing gears. Whoa, you could tell right away it was going faster. That was going pretty fast already, and he's not even halfway there. Then he says, you want me to let it out a little bit more? So he lets it out. I said, yes, let it out a little bit more. Now we're going scary fast, and it's still not all the way out. And uh, then I'm like, wow, this is really, we got to be careful here. It's going, we're going faster than we've ever gone before. He said, do you want me to let it out all the way? And on the inside, I said no. But on the outside, it came out yes. And, uh, and he let it out all the way. And it, we were just flying across that water, just skimming across that water, going scary, scary fast. Well, the faster we went, and that went, when the wind was pushing that sail, it would continue to lean forward. Now the sails leaning forward, well what that would do with the holes is they would start to lean like this as well. 
And instead of the water going under, it started to dip and some of the water started going over. I don't know what's going to happen, but I don't think it's going to be good. So I told Bob, stop, as if there's breaks. <laughs> and I say, stop, but it was too late. The water caught and the momentum pushed us down too far where it just got in there. The water caught us. We literally went down into the ground. We were only about six feet of water at this time. The sailboat lodged itself into the sand and it acted like a catapult. Boing, two bodies went flying through the air. <laughs> Splash! You know, we're both there. Literally, our sailboat is sticking up vertically out of the water. And the coach comes over, our teacher, and he says, well, I've never seen that before. I'm glad we could be future illustrations. <laughs> and uh, then we had to get help to get it up out of that, you know, get all the sand and mud on the front of it. And we're all wet, and the sailboat's all wet, and the sail's all wet, and all this. And now we're out in the bay. And the wind is still strong, but we have to get back to shore. But that is the direction from whence the wind is blowing. <laughs> it's coming from that way. How do we get back? The, is the direction of the vessel determined by the direction of the wind? Well, it's going this way. I guess we have to go this way. See ya. <laughs> you know, the, no, no, no. The direction of the vessel is determined by the trim of the sail. Now, I don't remember how to do this, and I wouldn't know how to teach it, but we wouldn't go directly in to the wind, but we would cut an angle and trim the sail in such a way that we would get closer. And then we cut an angle again and trim the sail in such a way that we'd actually use the wind that was going against us to push us forward in the direction that we desired in the opposite way. Trim the sail and cut the angle and continued as we zigzag, we made it back to shore. And the entire time there was this force and this wind that was pushing us opposite direction. Constantly, there is a wind, an outside force that is pushing against you, your marriage, your family to get you further away from the Bible, to get you further away from God. And this force, this constant influence that's trying to push you away is called the world. And this worldly influence is always there. It does not let up. Now, sometimes it's a little stronger. It's a little windier on that particular day. But the reality is it never lets up. But you need to decide that you will live for God and by his spirit strength, and that you will lead your family to also live for God against this worldly influence and that's this pressure that is constantly against your family. Will you decide like Noah that you will influence your family to go against this world and get into the ark of salvation and of the spirit-filled life? Amen. Will you trust God for your family tonight. How did Noah do that? How did he get his family into the ark? Now think about that. It had to be a struggle. It had to be a challenge. It had to be difficult because all of the world was saying, no, 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 there's never been rain. No, 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 uh, don't live for God. Do your own thing. No, don't, don't do this. And all of this is pushing against worldly influence, influence every imagination, only evil continually. But here is Noah. I believe two ways he did it. Number one, he led by example. And he led by example in three specific ways. First of all, he was a saved man who sought his family to be saved. He was a saved man who sought his family to be saved. The Bible says this in the passage. It says in verse 8, but Noah found what? Grace in the eyes of the Lord. Salvation is by grace through faith. Those that were in the Old Testament would look ahead by faith and through faith, but it is by grace. Noah wasn't going to heaven because he lived perfectly and he's the only one that did so and he was sinless. No, no, no. God would have to provide the Messiah for him just like for every other sinner on the planet. But Noah did have grace. And we say this, that these are the generations, verse 9 of Noah. Noah was a just man. 
Now, that word just is speaking, again, I believe, of his salvation, speaking of just Lot. Even though we look at Lot and his family and we say, wow, how wicked he was, he was actually saved man who was justified before God. He had moved from that position of death unto life, and he was now justified. Are you saved? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you, by grace, through faith, been saved in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ alone? Only through his blood can you have remission or forgiveness of sins. You need to trust Jesus if you have not done so. And if you have, then will you seek your family to be saved? Your children, your grandchildren, your parents, your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles, your extended family. Would you ask God to help you? The ark of, uh, is a beautiful picture of salvation. It includes sin and sin's judgment, but also salvation. Verse 5, again, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that every imagination of his thoughts, of his, thoughts or of his heart was only evil continually. Even the plowing of the wicked is sin. There is nothing that a, a, an unrighteous man can do to please Almighty God. There's nothing he can do. The reality is we're all sinners before him. And God said, I will, verse 7, I will destroy man whom I've cre created from the face of the earth. There is the judgment of sin. The wages of sin is death. But God provides a way. Only one ark with one door with one way. And that's just like Jesus Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus says in John 10, I am the door, and that, that we can come in and go through him. He's the only one. Are you saved? Once you are saved, by the way, when Noah got in, he was safe. Did he close the door? No. Who closed the door? God did. The Lord did. The Lord closed the door. So Noah couldn't push from the inside out. People that waited until it was too late and they started to claw and bang on, and I believe he heard them. They began to call and bang on the outside of the ark. They couldn't get in. No doubt they tried to pry open the door, but they couldn't do it. Only God could open the door. Once you are saved, you are eternally secure and safe, and you can have that assurance of that as well. Do you know that you're on your way to heaven? Have you really pursued seeing your family members trust Jesus Christ as Savior. Some perhaps in here have children that do need to be saved. Would you ask God to help you to lead your children to Jesus Christ at a young age and then adults as well? Some in here have grandchildren who need to be saved. There's a couple I remember who didn't know exactly how to explain salvation. They didn't know how to approach it with their children, the grandchildren. One was 11, one was 13. So they invited them to come over for the weekend and spend some time and stay the night and have some fun with them. And they just took one of our videos, an earlier video, I believe. They had them sit down and watch it. And then they asked them, do you understand what the Bible says and what the evangelist said about being saved? Yes. You understand that you need to trust Jesus Christ alone? Yes. Would you like to do that? And both of them made that decision with their grandparents helping them. You know what? You could do the same. You could ask for someone else to help out. But would you say, God, help me to help my family trust Jesus Christ as Savior? Would you pray for that person and continue to pray for them? But not only is he a saved man who sought his family to be saved, but secondly, he was a surrendered man, a surrendered man. Now notice, if you will, the word that doesn't look like it, speaking of surrender, but look at verse 9. It says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah is a just man and perfect in his generations. That means complete. You say, well, wait a minute. How do you get surrendered out of perfect? Okay, well, let me ask this. What is the perfect pie? What would you say? Hey, this would be the perfect pie. By the way, I just had some cheesecake this week that was outstanding, made by my wife. And uh, I just thought, man, that's awesome. This is great. Blackberry cheesecake was just outstanding. It was just great. What would be a perfect pie for you? Apple? Okay. Anyone else? 
Nobody, I can, nobody else. I say, I, I do not eat pies <laughs> or cakes. Uh, maybe some would say pecan or pecan, depends on where you are and how far south you are. Uh, others, you know, maybe it's a, um, um, a custard of some sort or maybe a chocolate or whatever, a fruit pie. You know what the perfect pie is? It's a complete pie, the one without a, pie, without a piece missing. <laughs> That's the perfect pie. When, when it's talking about perfect, it's talking about complete, isn't it? What if I said, hey, we made a pie for you, and um, here it is, and I brought you one partial piece that's left, and everything else has been eaten. You say, that doesn't look too good. <laughs> you also ate it for me, too. You know, the perfect pie would be intact. It'd be complete. What is God looking for? He's looking for your whole heart. Yes. He's looking for all of you to be fully surrendered. 2 Chronicles 16, 9, after the passage that we read tonight, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. You mean God is looking for those that have no sin in their heart whatsoever? No, 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 that's not what it's talking about. Whose heart is perfect toward him is that is completely given over and dependent upon him, those in whose heart he's trusting the Lord, in whose heart he can show himself strong because they are fully trusting in the Lord. And my heart is given toward him. Is there some area in your heart, in your life, that you have not yet surrendered to God? God keeps reminding us and bringing up just about every single message and sermon. Is there some other area that needs to be surrendered? So often I, I look back at the age 17 when I surrendered to preach and I thought, wow, I am surrendered, completely given. <laughs> and now I'm age 29 <laughs> and plus some. <laughs> and I look back and I look back and I say, wow, there's so many more decisions of surrender I've made since that age 17 and surrendered to God's will to preach his word. And oftentimes we think, there's nothing else for me to surrender. And then God shows us something else, a way of thinking, a way of life, something that we have in our, our life, a possession, a matter of whatever, that, uh, some resource that we're stewarding, that we're taking control over, and we're not truly surrendering. If I were to say, hey, I want to surrender over my iPad to you. If I did that, Caleb, would you be for that? He said, yes, I would be for that. And I say, okay, here's my iPad Pro, and unfortunately now it's a few years old. Uh, but if I say, hey, uh, if I give this over to you, you'd be pretty happy probably about that. But what if I gave it over to you and I say, hey, you can use it. In fact, you can use it all day long, all day. You can just use it, whatever you want to, you know, it's, you can use it. But I don't let go of it all day. <laughs> would that be awkward? <laughs> Yes, Brother Miller, that'd be very awkward. <laughs> and I, wherever you go, I, I'm, I'm there, and I'm holding on to it. And you're trying to listen to something, or you're trying to watch something, or you're trying to take notes. Brother Miller, can you let go? Mm -mm. <laughs> hey, I thought you said you could surrender. I am. <laughs> no, 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 your hands are still on. You know, oftentimes we say, well, I'm going to commit this to God. Well, oftentimes when we do that, if we do it in the, the true sense, the word commit means to give thyself wholly to or entrust yourself. But oftentimes when we use it, we mean I'm going to do this for God and I'm still in control. Right. No, God wants you to give everything to him and have your hands off in full surrender. Are you a surrendered person, a surrendered man? He led by example. He was a saved man who sought his family to be saved. He was a surrendered man. But thirdly, he was a spiritual man. Notice this in verse 9 again. It says this. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Who's the only other person in the scriptures that says that same phrase? This person walked with God. Who was that? Enoch, look at chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 24. In fact, it says it a couple of times in verse 22. It says that Enoch walked with God. In verse 24 of chapter 5, it says that Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Now, I believe perhaps the New Testament equivalent would be walking in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, the Bible says, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Are you walking in the Spirit consistently trusting the Lord to do what you cannot? 
Let me ask parents, are you walking in the Spirit without inconsistencies before your children? When they're young, you can pull the wool over their eyes. You can watch different things than they watch after they go to bed. And you can do different things that uh, uh, in front of them or behind their back. But when they start to pick up, dad acts differently at church than he does at home. Mom talks differently when she's speaking to a Christian than when she's speaking to someone else. They act differently when they're driving in their car or when they're just in the comfort of their home than they do in front of others. You can't pull the wool over their eyes for very long. They're going to start to see the anger in the father, the inconsistencies in the mother, the, the lack of spiritual consistency. One particular young man, he was doing a, a study for evangelism, and he had to interview another evangelist, and, and, uh, and he interviewed me, and he said, well, watch, watch the, your greatest weakness, and took me, uh, this was, I don't know, 15, uh, 20 years ago now, and I said, it took me like three seconds to answer, spiritual inconsistency, <laughs> spiritual inconsistency. I, I remember one time we were staying with a family, and um, before we had our, our truck and trailer, and we had a child, I believe at this point, I don't know if we did or not now that I say that, but nonetheless, we're staying with a the family, they had children, and it was difficult because of the attitude and the atmosphere. It was one on edge. Dad would yell at mom, mom would yell at dad, they would yell at the kids, kids would be disrespectful, talk back, all of this, and you know, they would, in, in one sentence, they say, hey, blah, 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 do this. Now, come gather for devotions. <laughs> Brother Miller and Mrs. Miller, would you like to come to devotions? No, <laughs> we would not. <laughs> and uh, it was awkward, and it, and it made us feel uncomfortable. And I thought, this is not the way it should be. And unfortunately, it was someone that was, even in the ministry, they were one way in front of others to whom they ministered. They are another way at home. Is there inconsistency? Uh, let me ask, do you lose your temper? Do you, do you fly off the handle? Could you imagine Noah as he's driving the ark? I'm, I'm sure there's a steering wheel, right? And the, the boys are fighting back there. Ham and Japheth. Ham, stop that. Get, get Japheth out of that headlock. <laughs> you know, don't, don't make me stop this thing. You know? <laughs> Do you think he yelled at them? Do you think, I know they're human, but how do you think he got his children in the ark if he didn't walk before them in a spiritual way? In fact, he did so in such a clear way, he was a consistent example. Look at chapter 6 and verse 22. Chapter 6 and verse 22. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. He was completely obedient. Chapter 7, verse 5. Chapter 7, verse 5. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Build this. Do it this way. Put the window here. Put one door here. All of this. It had to be uh, perfect. It had to be exactly as God commanded. And he did so, I believe, in the right way. Here he is, and he's trying to live before them in the spiritual, consistent way. Are you walking in the Spirit? It's not one step. You can't walk by taking one step. If I'm going to walk from here to the back where everyone else is uh, in the back section, I'd have to take a step to start and then another step and a third and a fourth and a fifth. Reiterated steps. Walking shows a consistency. And if I'm walking with someone, that means I have to walk their pace. I have to walk with them and be agreed with them. It has the idea of fellowship as well. Are you walking in a spiritually consistent way before your children? He led by example in those three ways. Salvation and surrender in a spiritual man. But how else did he get his family into the ark? How did he do it? Here's the second way. He got their heart. 
He got their heart. Would you take um, your Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6? Proverbs chapter 22 and uh, find verse 6, if you will. Psalms, Proverbs chapter 22, find verse 6 and see this, um, if you will. I'm sorry, we're going to see Proverbs 22, 6 in just a second, but it's actually chapter 23, uh, verse 26. Proverbs 23, 26. Proverbs 23, verse 26, the Bible says this, My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. So what is Noah doing? He's saying, okay, the world's pushing us this way. Okay, my son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. See how I'm walking? I'm walking with the Lord. I'm walking with God. Okay, you do as I'm doing. That, this is what Proverbs is saying, but I believe that's exactly what Noah implemented. He was a saved man. He was surrendered, but he was a spiritual man, and he sought to get his family's heart. How do you get your family's heart? How do you get the children's heart in three ways? Affection, obedience, and influence. First of all, affection. Give me thine heart. It does have to do with emotions. It does have to do with your love. It does have to do with relationship and emotional attachments. It is that idea. In Judges chapter 16, um, Samson kept playing around with sin. He kept getting so close with Delilah, and he would get closer and closer to the truth. Do you not remember that? He talked about his hair, and then finally he would say the actual truth. And when she saw that he told her all his heart, you know what happened? At that point, he gave his heart away to the wrong person to the one that he shouldn't have. He wanted her. His parents didn't approve. His parents didn't approve in other relationships either. But here is Samson. He is so selfish. He did not allow his parents to have an influence in his relationship decisions. If you're here and you're a teenager, if you are a young adult, college age, young career, you need to allow your parents to help you and influence you in such a way that you're including them in your relationship decisions. Should I go and be with this person? Should I uh, date this one or court this one? Well, the answer, of course, is no. Not until you're 45. <laughs> I'm fine after you're 45, but wait until then. Dad, but you're only, I don't care, <laughs> until you're 45. Um, now of, of course, I'm being silly, but I, I, I'm serious about this. I don't think high schoolers should date. Right. I don't think they should get involved in relationships. It is not helpful. It's distracting. Right. None of that is, is good. It, it just doesn't end well, typically. Yeah. And uh, I know there's like a 2% exception, <laughs> 1.5 maybe. Uh, but, but there's not many, okay? So I would say, don't do it. Don't wait, but date. Don't wait, no, don't date, but wait. Okay, that, that's what I would say. <laughs> Just remember 45 and you'll be safe. <laughs> so uh, obviously, though, we don't want the world's mentality either. Oh, well, how about if I date this person a little bit and date this person a little bit and date this person a, a little bit? Can God provide for you the one that he has for you? Yes, without breaking your heart and getting emotionally attached and then getting crushed and emotionally attached and giving your heart to this one and this wrong person, this wrong person. You don't have to be like a Samson who has a relationship that ends in these shambles. And anyone here that has had if marital and uh, relationship sh challenges, you would want to help the young people. You would want to say, don't do this. Listen to your parents in this way. You would want them to make wise decisions and to wait for the one that God has for them. Would you allow your parents to influence you in your affection and say to your parents, I love you? Now, um, sometimes when, the, you know, guys get to teenage years, there's somewhere in the teenage years, you know, they don't like to necessarily give a kiss, especially to dad anymore. Like, oh, yeah, dad, I mean, come on. And, uh, or uh, to give, uh, to say, I love you. Well, look, you could be 16, 
You could be 17, whatever. You still need to tell your dad. And you still need to tell your parents you love them. Um, the one who tells me he loves me the most is the toughest of my four. He's the one in the military. He's the one that could probably kill you 47 ways with this piece of paper, okay? <laughs> all right, so he's that one. He, at all times, he had, you hug him, and you're going to touch some type of weapon. I mean, there's going to be a knife, a sword, a gun, uh, a bomb. <laughs> I don't know. There's, I mean, he's just one of those self-defense, and of course, he's in the military. And uh, so, um, but he's tough. But you know what? He tells me every single time we're on their phone, and sometimes more than once, Dad, I love you. You know, you ought to do the same. And I am so thankful he included us and we gave our uh, permission and blessing to say, hey, yes, this is the one. We have others and our family now that they're old enough to be able to begin and start to have the awareness. And before they begin getting into a relationship or get emotionally attached and say, hey, mom and dad, what about her? Or what about this? Or, okay, not right now. It's not the right timing. Let's wait a little bit. You're 44. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, we're helping with these things. But we're having these discussions. And they're allowing us to influence them. I tell my daughter is, uh, I have your heart. And you're not giving it to any other um, guy. I was going to use another word. A any other guy. <laughs> uh, until we give our blessings and our permission would you allow and influence your children in affection? But not only affection, if you, get, if you get their heart, it's obedience. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Why? What's the implication? Observe my ways, so watch, so you can also take the same step. Watch me so you can also obey the Lord. May all who come behind us find us faithful and as well so they can obey as well. Obedience without hesitation. Obedience without question. Obedience without challenge. Obedience in the parent's absence. Let me ask, are you obeying the first time without hesitation? Well, do you challenge what your parents say? Well, what does this, you know, do we really have to? Why can't I go out um, with that t-shirt on? Well, because it says kill everyone. Okay, that's probably a good indication they shouldn't wear it, okay? Um, well, why can't I do this or why can't I do that? There's questions and there's challenging. And the reality is you need to obey, obey the first time. Obedience implies doing what you're told and doing it the first time. But how about in the parent's absence? I think of the Rechabites that are recorded in Jeremiah chapter 35. They obeyed their father, Jonadab. Now, it wasn't their immediate father. It was a forefather. And uh, he said to them, do not drink wine. Uh, I would think that would be any juice. And the wine obviously would include uh, any juice. By the way, Welch's grape juice, when they first came out, did you know this? That was Welch's wine. And it was unfermented. So wine in the Bible does not always mean fermented. So make sure it, it doesn't mean strong drink always. And so do not drink wine, uh, but also don't live in regular houses um, and don't plant crops. That was his command. So don't drink wine, whatever juice would be. Uh, don't live in regular houses and don't plant crops. Be a gypsy. I like those type of people. Uh, you know, just uh, yeah, live in a trailer and go. And uh, so uh, that would be his command. It's interesting. They, they lived this nomad lifestyle for a number of years. And um, then Jonadab had grandchildren, and they also lived this way. And then he had great-grandchildren. And then Jonadab died, and they continued to live this way for 300 years. Why aren't you living in a regular house? Why aren't you growing a vineyard of some sort and just stopping and planting crops? It's because, I don't know. <laughs> it's because our forefather, Jonadab, said, don't do this. They were obeying when their authority was long gone. It's the child's responsibility to hear. It's the parent's responsibility to be clear. You be clear with the command, give them direction, 
And then even in your absence, you should anticipate and expect obedience. If I'm going to get their heart, it means affection. It means obedience. And then finally, it means influence. Influence. This is probably the greatest of these ones. Look, if you would, back in Genesis chapter 5. In Genesis chapter 5, we see uh, Noah and uh, uh, when does he have his children? Uh, look at if Genesis chapter 5 and verse 32. The Bible says this in Noah, Genesis 5, 32. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And I don't think they were necessarily triplets, uh, but at that time frame, he then began to have children at 500 years of age. And you thought you were older when you had kids. Uh, 500, and he has kids. Now, that's incredible. But what's more incredible is later now, look at chapter 7 and verse 6. It says this, um, in chapter 7, verse 6, and Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. So that means his children are now 100 years of age. Of course, during this time, it's kind of like being a, a college and career class, <laughs> and it would be younger, but they're adults, 100. What else proves that? Well, they also were married. Now, in the Bible, in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord. Now, sometimes teenagers and college age say, Well, children, that means little kitties. And the little kitties, they're downstairs. They've already been dismissed. But that doesn't mean me. No, the word children means offspring. So that means you. If you've been sprung or hatched or whatever took place for you, then that means you as well. But I'm 16. Yes, and you need to obey. But I'm 18, and the law says... The Bible says you need to obey. But I am 19. Obey. 20. 21. You say, Brother Miller, how old? <laughs> how about 100? <laughs> we'll let you off the hook at 100. <laughs> you say, wait, wait, wait a minute. Isn't there an age? The Bible isn't clear on that. The only thing the Bible is clear on is at the marriage union. When the Bible says the man leaves his father and mother and cleaves unto his wife. Now, obviously, if a son or a daughter is 23 years of age, I'm not, I have a 23-year-old that's not married. Uh, I'm not going to call her up and say, did you floss? No, I'll say, did you brush your teeth? No, <laughs> I'm not going to ask these things. Now, did you, get to, you better get to bed right now, young lady. No, I don't do that, right? So there's certain things. There's a level of independence there, obviously. She's a school teacher. <laughs> she's these things. But you know, in reality, though, she's still under and needs to honor my authority. And that goes, I know, I know, that goes against everything that the world says. But in my mind, the only thing that is clear is the absolute place of marriage. You say, well... Are there other areas? Sure, you can have your debates, you can have your arguments, that's fine. Take it up with pastor afterwards, not with me. And I love just you know, creating these problems. Uh, but you know what? The only clear thing is the marriage relationship. But for the most part, you know who you are here tonight and who you, you need to still be obedient to your parents, honoring them and their choices. Sometimes the honoring looks different when you're in sixth grade and you're 23, obviously correct, but you're valuing them and you're respecting them and you're giving a weight to what they say and you're allowing them to be your greatest influence in your life. I'm not talking about in front of God. I'm not talking about in front of the word of God, but the human influence. Would you allow your parents to be your greatest influence in your life. So when you come to decisions, dad and mom, what, I want to honor you. What should I do with this? Dad and mom, do you think I should do this? Could you imagine Noah? Here he is. He's talking to his children and he says, all right, I've built an ark. <laughs> and of course, he's 600 now. Um, and uh, his sons have been helping him all this time. Could you imagine all the worldly influence that's pushing against them? What are you thinking? There's never been rain. What are you doing? You're building an ark, a boat. There's, it's not even by water. What are you doing? And they're pushing against. But they're still following. Dad said, God told them to build this ark. 
and we're going to help him. And so he influenced us and we're going to go ahead and go do this. And so they continued to follow. And Noah, he's 600. His children are 100. And they're married. According to what I can see, they're not under his authority at all. So how did he get them in the ark? Influence. Influence. Some in here, you're thinking this whole time, well, Brother Miller, this is sure a nice message from others, but our children are grown and they're outside of the house. Yes, that's true. Yes, they're not under your authority anymore, but you still should have influence. You should still be a spiritual influence. Some in here say, well, I took them to church and, you know, when the doors are open, but they're not in church now. They won't take the grandkids. Well, you take the grandkids. You influence them. You go make visits. Well, they're not close. You, I don't know, move <laughs> or get them to move. You're moving. <laughs> and uh, you influence them. But I'm, I am being serious, though, about the matter of influence. Yes. Would you say, God, help me to influence? Here, the greatest application, according to the context of this story, is an adult man influencing his married adult children and their wives. Pagan families, apparently, you don't see their families come in the ark, do you? But they had such a spiritual influence that even their wives were compliant to get in. And don't you think they were grateful? Are you influencing your adult children? Are you influencing your grandchildren? Are you influencing your great-grandchildren. Well, they're not born yet. But would you influence in such a way that you could be faithful, that you could lead a pathway to be able to influence them even generations after you're gone? May God help us to truly be found faithful. Tonight, would you say, God, would you help me as an adult, as a parent, to influence others? I have a card up here. And it says, my decision to influence others. I'm asking God to help me to influence. And then it has a blank where you could write a name or perhaps a couple of names. I'm asking God to help me to influence this person, number one, to see them saved if they're not already. Number two, to be an example in front of them of a surrendered and spiritually consistent Christian life. Number three, to follow God with all their heart, to influence them, to follow God with all their heart against the pressures of this world, then it has a place for your name and the date. And I'd like for you, as an adult, as a parent, as a grandparent, to say, dear God, would you help me to influence others? Would you fill this card out? Don't turn it into pastor. Don't give it back to me. But you just keep it. And may it be a reminder to you of the decision to say, I want to be like Noah, to influence others behind me and my children and adult children and grandchildren as well. This is the yellow decision slip to influence others for adults tonight. I have another decision slip. It's the blue. And it says this, I'm deciding to give my heart to my parents in the following ways. I'm trusting God to give my affection to my parents and allow them to help me to find the mate that God has for me. Number two, to obey my parents in such a way that I will be attentive to their instruction and sincerely obey them even in their absence. Number three, to allow my parents to influence my decisions in my future. And it has a place for your name and the date and for you to keep this. You can tell your parents or you can talk to them. That's totally up to you. But I'd encourage you as a young person, as a young adult, would you say, this is me? Perhaps here tonight, you'd say, well, I, I, I'm a widow or I'm a widower. You could say, God, would you help me to influence someone else? Because I know my spiritual walk hasn't been what it needs to be. So Lord, I, would you help me with that?
as an adult, maybe even married couple, would you ask the Lord to help you? And then, especially though, if you have children at home, would you please consider doing so? And then for the children and the teenagers and the young adults, would you take the blue card and say, I'm making the decision to give my heart to my parents. In just a moment, I like to do this. If, if you're willing to say, that's my decision, in just a moment, would you uh, stand to your feet and allow me to pray for you? And then after I pray for you, I'm just going to set these. I'll set probably a stack on each uh, of the corners. And would you come and then grab one of these? And then you could pray probably back at your seat would be the best thing just because of the, there's not much space. Perhaps off to the side or at the front, one of these chairs, open space. That would be fine as well. But you could take it and you could decide if there's enough space. You could sit up here or kneel up here or you could take it back to your seat. But would you tonight in just a moment say, okay, I'm willing to do this. I do want to make this decision. So I'm going to ask you as an adult in a moment, would you stand to your feet? Then I'd like to pray for you and just have a dedication prayer for us as a group. And then as a young person, would you stand to your feet? I'm making this decision. And then I'm going to encourage you. Would you step out after that, get one of these cards and either pray at your seat or pray at the front, wherever would be the best. Would you do that tonight? With our heads bowed,